So we looked at verse 15, the last two weeks, considering he is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of all creation. And really, we can sum that up ultimately by saying that he is the one who is preeminent, high over all. He is God, the Son. And speaking of Son, but putting a U there now and it's not an O, just think if the Son lost its light. If it's lost, if it lost its light, it would therefore lose its heat, wouldn't it, as well? The earth could not sustain life. The earth cannot sustain life in and of itself. It needs the sun, doesn't it? It needs the sun to give it light. It needs the sun to give it heat as it were. And if that was so, that the sun lost its light, then what would be left of this, we call planet Earth, would be, would be but a miserable rock. And all that would be left upon this miserable rock, rock would be evidence of what it once was. Which, when you step back and think about it, that's a little bit like us. That's a little bit like man. Man made in the image of God, lost the light of God in his life. And spiritually, well, became lifeless. Became like a, a, a dead planet, as it were, just, uh, uh, you know, rotating around in the or just orbiting, but not necessarily orbiting now, just uh, going meaninglessly through un the universe, spiritually lifeless. We'd be miserable creatures if we were left like that. All you would have would be an evidence, as it were, of what man once was. And in effect, when you look around in the world today, that is kind of what you see something of a semblance that man is made in the image of God. We have uh, many characteristics and qualities that you, you have to say, there is evidence of a creator. There is evidence that we're made in the image of God. Just the mind and the understanding of man and uh, uh, the ability to create things and so forth. This is all part of that image uh, that we once uh, displayed so perfectly, but now has been marred beyond description and spiritually lifeless. All that's left is uh, an evidence of what we once were. And even uh, not just man now, but think of the heavens, think of the earth. A calamity, a disaster, worse than the sun failing is effectively uh, being brought in our world through the fall of man. The whole creation is under the curse that is upon man as it uh, the invisible world has been affected. That is the world of angels and so forth. And the visible world of man. Now, man wasn't responsible for the invisible world of angels, but there, there's been a fall there, hasn't there? Because there were those who were created by God to be worshippers of God, and they, in their pride and so forth, set themselves up to be like God. And there was a, a cataclysmic event in the invisible world as the devil and all those with him fell and have brought man into a similar state, a state of darkness. The invisible world has been a fall, and in the visible world of man there's been a fall. And there is left a ruin of what we once were and what creation once was too. But of course, that is not the end. It's not like a, a dead star, as I say, that's just floating around in the universe. As it, man is not to be left to be a ruin. Creation is not going to rot in an eternal decay. We read in verse 16, and at the end there, all things were created through him and for him. If he created all things and he created all things for him, is he going to allow? allow all things to remain in a state of destruction, as it were. You know, David, David, when he went off with the Philistines, there's a, a what if, isn't there, a history? There's a what if, this is an aside, but here's a what if. You know the story where David goes off uh, with Achish and he's going to fight uh, alongside the Philistines against King Saul. 
of Israel. And Achan is convinced that David is hated by Saul, which of course he is, but that David will fight for the Philistines, uh, but the other Philistines are uh, no better. And they say, no, he's not to fight. And so he's sent back to Ziklag. And the what if of history would be that David had stayed there to fight. What would David have done? We know the answer, don't we? We know what would have happened. But the point for us in this is that he goes back to Ziklag and what does he find? He and his men, they find that their wives and their children, everything has been taken away. The Amalekites have been and taken these things away from them. And so they have to go and they have to rescue them. And David and his men, they bring all that and much more besides. They're not going to allow their loved ones to be captured by an enemy. And they go and deliver them. Well, that's David, who was a man after God's own heart, rescuing his, that he loves, and he said he's half of them. How much more than all? How much more than all? David mirrors him. David mirrors and after God's own mind. how much more the Lord with his creation, when we might say his creation has been robbed, his creation has been attacked, his people have been taken captive. How much more will the Lord come to deliver them? And of course, that's what the gospel is all about, isn't it? The Lord's great uh, deliverance. And you read that here in verse 20. Well, speaking of Christ again, reconciling to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. You see his reconciliation is that on earth, and that is the creation as well, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you don't need me to remind you now, but I will. Romans 8 speaks about creation groaning, longing to be set, longing to be set free from the bondage it's in because of the curse that is upon it. Through the fall of man. Well, Christ has come to reconcile these things, whether on earth or in heaven, to bring peace by the blood of the cross. But our focus tonight is on verses 16 and 17. For by him all things were created in heaven on and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. And these verses together, really, we can say in verse 15, we looked and considered that the image of the invisible God. He's very God, isn't he? And he is the firstborn of all creation. That's speaking of his preeminence. It's not speaking of his birth, but of course includes that in his humanity. But he's God the Son. He's eternal. And he's high over all. And these verses, uh, as we go on to see these verses, they prove and they show, they display his supremacy. They display his preeminency. They display that he is high over all. The firstborn, that is, that word firstborn, remember, preeminence, preeminence over all creation. So the first thing to consider is he is the creator of all. And you read that there in verse, you can read it in various places in the scriptures, can't you? You read it in verse 16 there, the first part of that verse where it says, for by him, all things, all things were created. Nothing exists of itself. Nothing exists by itself. All things were created by him. Heaven, earth, whether it's the highest heavens we spoke of when we read uh, Psalm 148, or whether it's the very uh, core of the earth, he has created the whole universe, as it says there. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. And then he goes on to say, visible and invisible, above and below. The visible heavens above, he's created them. The sun, the moon, and the stars. You know, when I let the dog out uh, last thing at night, the last few nights, it's been cloudless. And you can see, you can see it very well, really do, in rain, and you've got the street lights and everything. They prove the improvement around our area, so they're not glaring up at the sky. But you can see stars, 
and you can see the moon and so forth. And it's it's wonderful, isn't it, to go out, especially on a summer's night when it's not so cold and you can go out and sit there, especially if you live somewhere rural. I'm sure you must get some lovely, uh, yeah. <laughs> I remember we camped. We camped in someone's uh, grounds, as it were, in the summer, and they lived between Folkestone and Dover. And there wasn't much of the light, uh, light the light from Folkestone or Dover to mar what you could see. And uh, you see these shooting stars and these, it's that time of year, wasn't it? It's absolutely wonderful. And I've told you before, Chris Thomas uh, sailing through the Pacific and there's a, an emergent navy and lying out on deck at night and just seeing such a beautiful, beautiful sky where there's no light of man to uh, spoil it in any way. And, and these stars, the sun and the moon, they're made by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the creator of all that is visible that we can see in the heavens above. And of course, the invisible, uh, the the uh, the place, as it were, where no rocket can go. That is to say, uh, the invisible world of angels. He created the angels, and he created uh, uh, all of these beings, all of these creatures. Whether you there's a study to go through and and see what different types of angelic beings there are, uh, cherubim, seraphim, and so forth. Try and study them, but you see, he's created them all. And then on earth, that which is visible, that which is visible. We we read of it in, in Psalm 148 fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind, mountains, hills, fruit trees, uh, cedars. You're going to see the stormy wind as such, but you see the effects, don't you? Beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds. I didn't read the ones of the heavens above, but it's there, the sun, moon and stars, we spoke of them. He created all these visible things on earth, but he also created that which is invisible. And I'm not now thinking of air, though he created that. But your soul and mine. He created the soul that is in the heart of mankind. He created our soul, didn't he? The invisible soul of man. And then it goes on to say, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers or authorities. So think of rulers, thrones, dominions, authorities, both visible and invisible. Dominions in the heavens. Angelic beings and uh, the hierarchy, as it were, that the Lord has set in place. Uh, the very highest of the angels, Gabriel and Michael and so on. The devil was there, wasn't he, as one who was highly esteemed, but he was cast out as those dominions. The order created by the Lord. And then on earth, the rulers of the earth. The kingdoms have their existence in and through the Son of God. He is the creator of all. And then we can say that he is, secondly, he is the self-existent one. The self-existent one. Nothing has existence in and of itself. Everything is created by him. But he himself has no beginning. And no end. He is, I was going to put as a, as a heading for this part, uh, the eternal one. He's the eternal one, but the self existent one here uh, does us a, a greater service because we're saying nothing can exist without a creator making it. The creator who's made it. He exists without nothing having made him. He's self-existent. He has never not been and he never will not be as it were. And so we, we, we understand from scripture that there's nothing that can add to God. There's nothing can take away from God. He's self-existent. He needs no support. He has no dependence. He's self and all sufficient. The self-existent one. Even the son needs uh, fuel doesn't to fire up, as it were, in the morning. <laughs> the sun's got to fire up in the morning. <laughs> it needs fuel to do this, doesn't it? It needs fuel to, 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 to uh, as it were, to light um, Australia in the morning. 
<laughs> and then England in the morning, our morning. It's Everything needs something to keep it going. We need fuel to keep us going, but the Lord doesn't. And we read there in the last part of that verse, all things were created through him and for him. And it's that word, he's created all things, but it's all for him. For him. And that means, that tells us, and we could compare this with other parts of scripture that tell us likewise, it's all for his glory. Everything that he has created, its ultimate purpose is to glorify God. And we can go even further and kind of narrow that down in a sense, that it was the father's will. The father delights in his son. And it was the father's will that what he has created, he created it so that it can delight in his son. All things are created ultimately for his son. It was created by the son, for the son, at the behest at the will of the father. The son has carried it all out. And it's all for him. It's all to bring glory for him. It's all for, as it were, his uh, eternal delight. Not that he needs it. But God delights, doesn't he? Our praise and our praise of his son. You know, there are times in the church, history of the church, where the focus is too heavily on one person of the Trinity to the detriment of, of others. And perhaps in many circles today, it might be that there's been too much of a focus supposedly on the Holy Spirit, though I wonder what kind of spirit it is that they're seeking to drum up and, and so forth. But uh, there were times when there's uh, been overly a focus on, on God the Father and, uh, and not on the Son in a sense. But the Son is the one who makes the Father known to us. And you can't separate one from the other, can you, in that sense? It's the great and mighty Godhead who uh, rules and reigns over us. But the way we know the Father is through the Son. And I think, if anything, in the church today, there's a kind of a neglect of all three persons of the Trinity. And we just use, in a light way, the term God. God. We don't address the Father through the Son by the Spirit. We just address God as it were, as though God is some kind of force and not really, uh, that there are not really three persons in the God. But the scriptures, the scriptures declare Father, Son, and Spirit. The scriptures declare to us that the way to know God is through the Son, through the Son and the worship of the Son. Everything, ultimately, the purpose of everything, the Father's delight is in his Son, and it is the Father's good pleasure to bring glory Yes, to himself, but glory to his son. All things were created through him and for him. All things were there, as it were, to set forth him, Christ, to magnify him, to bring praise to God the Son. Psalm 148, we're told, we read it, didn't we? And we're told in that psalm there that we are to... Praise, or it's, a, it's a, an exhortation to heaven, really. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. And then in verse 4, it says, having spoken of the sun, moon, and stars, praise him in your highest heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded, and they were created. But all things were created by him. All things were created by him, the son, the will of the father. The Son was the creator, wasn't he? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was, well, I'm going to read it in a moment. So let's let's turn there now into to, uh, John chapter 1 and just remind ourselves, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. So with that in mind, that the Son made all things, and without him nothing was made uh, that was made. We come back to Psalm 148, and when we read, praise him in highest heavens, in waters above the heavens, let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. We're talking of God the Son, aren't we? We're talking of God the Son. We're not separating God the Father. We can say, yes, this is praise to the Lord God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But here we're reminded in Colossians, all things were created for the Son, by the Son, 
and for the sun. And then in that same Psalm 148, having spoken of the heavens and the heights of heaven, we read in verse 7, praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all deeps, because he has created all things. Verse 13, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. So it's a magnify to bring praise to him, the one who created all things. And before he did all this, this great work of creation, this great work of creating all things, look at verse 17. He's before all things. He's before all things. Before he did his work of creation, he was in existence. Of him, we can say, the preeminent one, the preeminent one. Of him we can say, he is the great I am. I am. When Moses is told, tell them I am has sent you to. I am. Who's speaking? It's God the Son, isn't it? It's God the Son. He makes that clear in John's gospel. The I am's of Christ. I am the bread and the life. I am the living water. I am seven of them. And one of the ones is not as clear in a sense of the teaching, but the effects of it. When they come to arrest him in Gethsemane and they come and they're charging, they, who is it you see? Whom is it you see? Jesus. I am, he says. And every translation in English for some foolish reason puts he after I am. But it doesn't say that in the original. He gives the holy name. A name that should not be said by anyone but to declare themselves, I am, is blessed me, unless it is I am who is doing it. And it's I am who is speaking. And you know what happens, don't you? Uh, when he says, I am, they fall back into the ground, as it were, like power of his voice, not just the shock that someone should say such a thing. There's power, power. The voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. We sung a hymn that said about, uh, it was a Luke hymn, wasn't it, that he could destroy the devil from a word from his mouth. He destroyed those who would come and be devils to him, didn't he? They went up to the floor as it went and fell backwards. He is the great I am. And in Hebrews, we have that again uh, uh, restated there long ago, chapter one, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. See, it's all for him. He's the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. See, he's the creator. He's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint. He is the image of the invisible God, the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. We're going to come to that in a moment. His sustaining power course just to finish that after making purification for sins he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on fire you know when i was searching out truth and before i fell into buddhism i came to the conclusion that i couldn't get away from this just looking at creation that has to be the creator that has to be god buddhism tried to uh, take that thought away from me but it failed ultimately to be a god, that's to be a traitor. It's just nonsense to say that things got here by chance, that from an explosion could come all the things we have now. That a person can be created, who can see that out of their flesh, and can think about what they're seeing, and, and can speak, and all the different things. You know, it's just incredible, isn't it? How can that evolve? And you know how ridiculous that thought is that things could evolve. But for me, I thought there has to be a god because of all this. But then these Christians go on about this man, Jesus, Jesus Christ. And I couldn't accept that there could be such a person as Jesus whom we should worship. Because the only person I could see that we should worship is God himself. Not a, a mere man thinking that this Jesus was but a man as it were. And then you read 
And then I read sometime afterwards, I read John chapter one. In the beginning was the word. And as I read through that and, and thought through that and contemplated that, it became clear that I'd either got to say, well, that is rubbish and throw it away, or submit, as it were, to it, bow before it and say, that is clear declaration. Jesus is none other than God. And so the word of God reveals him. And so the word of God sets him forth. All three of those passages here in Colossians, John chapter 1, Hebrews 1, all three of them declare the Lord Jesus Christ to be God and creator. There is never a time where he's not been the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is the self-existent one. But then third, and really where to focus tonight, is that he holds and sustains all things. He holds all things together. At home, we've got some Yuhu glue. And Yuhu glue isn't any good. Not for what I wanted it. And in fact, thinking about it, when I was a boy and I'd done some pull-ups in the bathroom, and destroyed a towel rail before my dad or his wife came home to find out. I got some Yoohoo and found out it wasn't any good. I stuck some Yoohoo on it and tried to put it together and it held a little bit. And uh, unless you put a towel on there, so I didn't dare put a towel on there. I kind of chopped it up so hopefully it would dry and harden. But uh, when they came home, they went to put a towel on it. The whole thing collapsed. Yoohoo doesn't hold a towel rail together. It's not strong enough to do that. But I'll tell you what Yuhu is good for. Yuhu is good when you've got a digital piano and the felt that is there that the keys bash into, when the felt is coming away, you call up a man, he comes around, he opens up the back, he gets out some, yes, some clothes cakes, and he glues the felt with Yuhu, and then he pegs it with the clothes cakes. And he waits until it dries, and then he takes them off one by one, and then he gets uh, the person who knows how to play it to come and play um, Raindrop or, or uh, whatever it is, <laughs> some such thing on there. And it works perfect. Yuhu is good for holding the felt together, but it's not good for holding a towel rail together. Different glue, I learned, different glues hold different things together. Think about leaders in our world. David was not the one who was to build the temple for the Lord. Because the Lord said, well, you've been a man of war. You've been a man of war. It's not for you. It'll be your son who will build the temple. Winston Churchill was the right person to hold our country together in May 1940. When it came to 1945 and the end of the war and the first general election in our nation for, I think, something like 10 years, there was a landslide victory, but it wasn't for Winston Churchill or his party. The people said en masse, he's a man for war, not peace. And they voted in the opposition with a landslide victory. Different people are needed at different times to hold the people together. Children sing a song. He's got the whole world in his hands. The whole wide world in his hands. But again, who's got the world in his hands? And the answer is, God has got the world in his hands. And that's right. But coming back to what I was saying before, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Colossian heresy, those who are teaching and coming around into Colossae and saying, you know, uh, we are the ones who've got this secret knowledge. We've got a secret knowledge that is only known by a select few, not for you or unless perhaps you pay the money or whatever. And one of the things they were teaching was that Jesus was merely a man and he wasn't God. And so part of the reason for this great letter 
is Paul, as he stated here, to state the preeminence of Christ, that he is God the Son. They need to know in Colossae that Jesus is the Son of God. And we live today in a nation, in a land of inclusivism, don't we? And we have now a, a Hindu prime minister. And we think, we would imagine that with a Hindu prime minister, that kind of inclusivism will increase what's going to happen next year when there is a coronation. It'll be very interesting to see, won't it? Uh, how that will be uh, undertaken on a, a religious level, as it, particularly with a man who's now become king, who wanted to be the defender of faiths as opposed to the faith. It'll be interesting to see how things uh, change and develop in our nation. All the more reason for Christians to pray. Uh, and also, all the more reason that it's vital for us that we know who holds it all together, that we know who holds us together. The one who holds all things together is, is Christ. Is Christ. He's before all things. And in him, all things hold together. In our hearts, our hearts are held together when we set him forth in our hearts, when our hearts are filled with him, and when our lips profess him. That's the result, isn't it, of a heart that is given over to Christ, is it? Who has the world in his hands? It's the Son of God. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's got the whole world in his hands. Nothing can happen without his will. When I was a, a boy, probably about Harry's age, I used to go into the attic at my grandpa's house. And up in the attic, he had a ladder that would be there, would come down, and we'd climb up into the attic, push the thingy bob up, uh, the lid, as it were, as I'd call it. And we'd go into the attic and he'd put the lights on. And there'd be right around this what seemed to be a circular room, but it's just the way you got the layout. There was a, a big train set. It's an old gauge layout, an old gauge train set. It went all around this, what to me was a large attic. And my grandfather had made all of it. He'd made the engines, made them all. And I used to like telling friends at school and anyone who here, he made them all from scratch, don't you know? I didn't really know what scratch meant, but that's what I was told. He'd made them all from scratch. But it turns out he'd actually just got some metal and he'd, he'd uh, got his uh, hacksaw and all that sort of stuff and cut it all round and, and then put it all together in, in a model of the, a scaled model of the real things. And he'd made about, maybe in his life, he made about 20 of these, and they were remarkable. But the reason I mention it is because it was his layout, and he was the one who controlled it. No one else knew what would happen if he pressed that button or this button, but he knew it all. And when he had a train going around there, if he pressed a button, you'd hear mm -hmm. And then the train would go off onto another line, so several lines going around. There was a tunnel and so forth. I knew everything about his creation except he didn't know when there was a little man that was going to be run on the train that had been put there by the annoying little grandson that was me. Because that's what I would do. I would, when he wasn't looking, I would get from the platform, someone had been waiting for a train for what seemed to be too long. And I would take him and I'd take him over the other side, the other side of the tunnel, so he didn't see it. And I'd plonk him there. And then the train would come out, and sometimes it might be an almighty crash. Grandpa's train, he controlled it. But he didn't control the man on the track. But you see, when it comes to the Lord, there's nothing, nothing that surprises the Lord. Nothing that can derail the Lord's plans and purposes. Nothing. Everything happens to bring about his purpose. Everything. The little flower that opens. The cold wind in the winter. The war in Ukraine. Some Christian people, by the name of Christian, would give the impression that the Lord is flapping. But what's going on in Ukraine? Hadn't seen that. Doesn't know what to do about it. And so forth. Rubbish. Rubbish. Everything happens to bring about his purpose. It's all in his control. It's all in his will. 
Winston Churchill, I don't know if he actually said this, but if you understand his life really, he probably did because he said many things. I'm sure he probably later on regretted. But one of the things he says in a, a recent uh, drama film, uh, what's it called? Darkness. What's it called? Oh, wow. Darkest Hour. Thank you. Darkest Hour. One of the things there he says that it, they're in a time of peril, it's the darkest hour. And he says, um, the king has been meddling. The king has been meddling and doing this and saying that. And he says, he says, why doesn't the king do what God has done and leave us alone? Leave us to it. Deism, you see, this whole idea that God has made the world is like the watchmaker wound up the clock and just left it and has disappeared and doesn't really want anything more to do. That's deism. And that's what Winston Churchill there, whether he actually said that, I don't know. Uh, but that's what they were putting the, into the lips of Winston Churchill there, that deism, that God has just wound it all up and has left, left us to it. But you see, you read here, he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. He hasn't wound it up and left it. He's in control. He's here. It's his creation. All was made by him and for him. Even down to the thrones. Whether visible or invisible, all things were created through him and for him. For now, yes, it's hard at times to see that in our broken world, whether or in Ukraine, to mention but one thing. It's hard to see that in anyway. But as Christians, as Christians, the word of God and the Holy Spirit as our teacher calls us to believe that in him all things hold together. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? That's faith. You grasp this by faith and you live by faith, not by sight. Not by sight. You trust in the Lord in all these ways. You don't lean on the world's understanding or your own understanding. All your ways you acknowledge him. Because just as he's going to direct your path, so he's directing the path of the world. It's hard to see it now in a broken world, but by faith, that's what we're called to do. And to help us, we have the biblical account, we have the Bible account with its histories and its warnings and its prophecies. And then we have world history, all showing, all displaying that in him all things hold together. Not least the Spanish Armada. Spanish Armada came and God blew, as it were, the Spanish Armada to the rocks and round the British Isles because uh, that would have destroyed our nation and sent us back into the arms of, well, not the arms, but the chains of Catholicism, is not it? Roman Catholicism. God was in control of that. What man? Bringing about his purpose and his will. You know, if you go to my mum's uh, house, she has, I don't know, how many tapestries? <laughs> She's got loads of them, must have about. 40, 30, 40, something like that. As you come in, she's a, um, what's it called? A flat lip? No, it's not a flat lip. It's a masonette. And so you come in through a front door downstairs and you climb up the stairs. Let's go up the stairs. They're all the way up the stairs. All the way. High and low and in between and sideways and then the rest of it. And then you come in and what's the hallway and then the front room. And they're everywhere, these tapestries. And if you like tapestries, they're varying degrees of excellency to look at and great pictures, as it were, that she's tapestry, <laughs> weaved, stitched, all right, weaved, stitched, tapestry. So to look at, they're, they're good to look at. But imagine if they were hung in reverse. Imagine if you were seeing the back side of the tapestry. What would it look like then? There may be evidence that there's kind of like a bit of design here, that there's something that uh, makes some sense, but realistically, it would be confusion, wouldn't it? Because you're seeing the reverse. But then you turn it over, you turn it over. Yeah, you see it. You see, that's our world now. It's like a tapestry in reverse. But at the end of the age, when the Lord returns, or when you go to glory, the things that you can't comprehend now begin to make sense. To be turned over at the end of the age. In Hebrews uh, chapter 2, we read, You made him for a little while, speaking of Christ, lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor. It's chapter 2, verse 7. You crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, 
He's not left anything outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor. You see that by faith. The world doesn't see it. It's only by faith we see it because of the suffering of death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everything. You see, these things have taken place. These things have taken place. But everything now is at present. We don't see it in subjection to him. We see the reverse of the tapestry. But everything will be in subjection to him. In other words, he is the preeminent one over all. You ask people out there, and they would only use Jesus' name as a swear word. I'm not submitting to him, they would say. He is the preeminent one. But all things now aren't yet subject to him in the way that they will. It's a tapestry in the verse. It will be turned over to look more marvellous than anything my mother could uh, tapestry up. Or think of uh, an app, a plain track around. You might not have seen this. But plane track wraps, you, you've had one from time to time, haven't you? You've had one as well. She likes to, if you're going on a holiday, there's a first person over there who will track your flights. She even has been able to manage the track some military ones as well and find out there, you know, where they're going when they've landed in so oh the ship, it's okay. Well, there you are. But if we're up in space. We're up in space. We're thinking, if you've ever seen a, a, a plane track at that, it's quite incredible. Because there seems to be so many planes going crisscrossing and so forth. It just seems incredible. How could it be that there are several collisions a day? You know, for anyone who's about to fly, you know, you should be worried because you know there must be hundreds of them crashing every day. And yet to take away your fears. There isn't. There isn't, because man, fallen though he is, has still a semblance of the image of God with whom in whose image he was made. Still has something of that image of the ability to be able to hold things together, as it were, of the ability to be able to plan and, and to be able to carry things out. But they look up on that app anyway, it's something like this. It shows them, doesn't it? It is no collision. Amazing control. How much more? How much more? The whole universe and everything that goes on. How much more of the control and the organization of the one who is preeminent, who is high over all, who holds all things together. And then finally, and hopefully briefly, I said he holds and he sustains all. Sustainer of all. Again, it's there, holding all things together, sustaining all things, keeping all things together. I worked in a place in the early days of computer, and you can hear this lady's voice to this day uh, as she would flap and run around in the different departments saying, the network is down again, the network is down again. It meant we couldn't go on the computers. The network was down. Even. She wasn't talking about the internet. She was talking about the intranet or something, I don't know, but it was, it was the internal network. And so we couldn't communicate with one another internally because it was down. Or this winter, this talk of there being the, uh, the power down, as it were, no electricity. Uh, have your, um, your torches ready, or your candles, or your Caligas fire turned upside down so you can boil a kettle on it or something. Get those things ready. Because the electricity could be down. The sun, if it lost its light, we said, or well, I said, Earth could not sustain life. But just imagine for one moment, if the Lord was to withdraw his sustaining energy from our universe, it wouldn't be a kind of universe with planets and stars and things. There would be no existence. There would be nothing. If God were to withdraw his energy, but for a moment, there could be nothing. Nothing can continue. Nothing can have existence outside of him. There can be no universe. Even for a millisecond, if he were to withdraw, as it were, his sustaining power, his control, there could be nothing. Absolutely nothing. Paul says to the Athenians, he says to them, in him we live and move and we have our being. We have our being. Without him, we have no being. We have no existence. There's nothing. 
only he is a self-existent one. On the seventh day, he rested from his work of creation, but he never, not even for a trilly second, he never has work, uh, rested from his work of uh, sustenation. He's never ceased from that, even for a trilly second. His work of sustaining, of holding things together, hasn't even for a trilly second. And he's a sustainer for a reason. And it's not left to ruin this world for a reason. For by him all things were made, and for him all things were made. And he is the one there in verse 20 who is to reconcile all things to himself by the blood of his cross. He came. This is how much God loved the world. He sent his son to die on that cross in order to redeem that which was fallen back to himself, whether visible or invisible. I won't read it now, but we could turn to Romans 8 and, and the latter verses there that speak about nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. No, well, the, the hymn writer says it doesn't need no power of man, no steep, no, no scheme of man, no power of hell. And it says it there, it declares it in the last verses of Romans 8. And all this should, to conclude, should humble us. It should humble us. The hymn writer, what does he say? I need thee every hour. Every hour we we need thee every moment. We need thee every truly second. That's how humbling this is. If you and I need his support to, to breathe, we need to take that advantage, don't we? But we need his support to breathe. How much more? How much more? Every hour of our life, every hour of our life, but how much more do we need to pray for every area of that? So are you a, are you a praying son? Are you a, a, a believer, first of all? Do you understand and believe uh, this truth as it is set down here? The image of the invisible God has come to redeem his fallen world, the world that was created by him and for him. He's come to reconcile. Are you reconciled to him this night? And are you, if you are, are you seeing your need to pray over every area of your life? Do we see, or how much do we see? Do we see our total dependency upon him? And as we go on in the Christian life, don't let yourself get filled up with any sense of I can do this. The Lord has strengthened me, I can do this. We surely, as we go on, we see how much more we're dependent than we thought we were. We need thee every moment, every area of our life. He is the creator of all. He's a self-existent one. He's the one who holds and sustains all things. And that calls finally to obedience. Obedience unto him. To live for him. To honour him with our lives. To bring glory to his name. To lift the name of Jesus high over all. Because he is the preeminent one. Amen. Um.